Welcome everybody to the uh, Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum. On behalf of my colleagues and Melody Gallu, who's our organizer and administrator of the uh, Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum, we really appreciate you joining us uh, to talk about some of the updates from the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting. Um, Melody just disappeared, but you can see the QR code there, uh, which gives you and the uh, internet um, address for the forum because we record these programs. And so if you want to send them on to other people, you can as well. Uh, we really appreciate you participating in the forum. It's all about you and these programs are for you. So definitely email Melody. If you have, if you know people who want to participate, we're happy to add them to the uh, email list and then email topics, things you want to hear about anytime. I'm Hope Rugo and a breast medical oncologist uh, at UCSF, and I'm joined by my colleagues this evening who volunteer their time to do the forum, uh, Laura Hubbard. I'm just going in the order of how people appear on my screen. Uh, Laura Hubbard, our newest faculty member, uh, who has already been with us now for more than a year, amazing, uh, and uh, then Joe Chen who you can see also, who's uh, been here for quite a number of years. I won't say how many any of us have been here. And uh, Michelle Melisco, um, all of us work closely together in our breast oncology uh, program. We don't have a surgeon with us this evening, a radiation oncologist, but I think uh, that will work for all of the topics that we want to address uh, this evening. Also, we're, you know, we often take July and August off this year. We're having, of course, this time in, um, in this meeting in July, uh, but we're going to take our usual summer break and we'll send out notices for when our next meeting will be either in September or in uh, early October. Um, so now uh, here you are on this program. We're going to talk about things. How do you ask questions? So you can see in the lower part of your screen on Zoom, there's a Q&A button. And the um, Q&A button, which Kelly Shanahan has already sent a lovely note to us saying that she appreciates our time, um, is a great place to put in your uh, questions. We can answer them live or we can answer them uh, writing. So it allows us to answer those questions even if we don't have enough time. Um, and uh, we usually reserve the chat just for um, urgent issues that occur, et cetera. And Melody's on hand to help you in case you have any trouble with connections or hearing or whatever. So we have uh, some interesting studies to talk about this evening. Um, there was a lot of uh, data on hormone therapy at ASCO, both for early stage breast cancer and for metastatic breast cancer, looking at our cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors and how we can optimally use them. And we'll talk about both uh, those different studies, two studies in the early stage uh, setting. So treating patients with uh, early stage breast cancer and two studies with metastatic breast cancer. And then there were also some really interesting studies that were focusing on chemotherapy and how we treat patients um, in metastatic and early stage breast cancer. One study looking at how we give the drug capecitabine or Zolota in order to try and keep effectiveness and not have side effects as much. And then a second study that really looked at who needs more chemotherapy or less by trying to test this out in the pre surgery setting, so neoadjuvant. And this is an area of great interest for us because it's a big part of our by 2 neoadjuvant program. So we'll start out with the last part that I mentioned, talking about chemotherapy with an altered schedule of capecitabine, the so-called 7 and 7 trial. Um, and we'll discuss that a little bit, and then we'll talk about the neoadjuvant interesting trial called for gain. And Michelle. Okay, well, thanks and welcome everyone um, being here for the summer. I am going to share my slides. And um, so one of the things that I come across with many of my patients who are getting Cape Cytobine, uh, we know that hand foot syndrome is one of the more challenging um, side effects from this medication. When we talk about this medication uh, to patients, we describe that they might get diarrhea, GI upset, um, so can everybody see those things now? Yes, I'm going to go to slideshow and say from the beginning. So hopefully people can see that. So can everybody see my screen now? Yes. And so, you know, there the drug capecitabine was approved um, using a 14-day on and seven-day off schedule at a, a standard dose um, that we all have really learned is really far above what anybody in the United States can tolerate. And so I pretty much ignore, you know, trying to calculate what a patient's, um, you know, what would be equivalent to the patient's FDA approved dose is 
and have a tendency to sort of use the 500 milligram tablets to, you know, uh, estimate what I think the patient might tolerate based on their history, based on their size. And, um, you know, oftentimes that works out to be somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 milligrams a day. Um, but we do start off on the seven, um, 14 day on and seven day off schedule. And many patients get this significant hand foot syndrome that prevents them from being able to walk um, as much as they being as active as they'd like to be. Um, you know, not be able to, you know, their hands get very sore where they bump into things, their fingertips are very sore. So this clinical trial looked at using a fixed dose of capecitabine, um, meaning not based on body surface area, but rather just a fixed dose as compared to the standard dose. And um, it was called the X77 um, trial. And I'm going to skip through this. We talked about, you know, the fact that capecitabine has these unique side effects of diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, and um, mouth sores. And that the FDA approved dosing, um, you know, really does have significant toxicity, this high dose of 1,250 milligrams per meter squared twice a day, most patients just can't tolerate it. So skipping ahead, um, the design of this trial was to randomize patients in a one-to-one -one design to receive either the standard dose of, um, you know, which would be, you know, the FDA approved dose, which for most patients is quite intolerable, or this fixed dosing of capecitabine at 1,500 milligrams twice a day in a seven day on and seven day off schedule. And patients had scans every 12 weeks and, um, the, the dosing schedule, um, some cycle, the cycles for the seven on seven off were considered 14 day cycles, seven, 14 on seven off were 21 day cycles. And um, the primary endpoint was to look at the rate of progression free survival at three months. And then they were also looking at the overall progression free survival and overall toxicity response rates and just general toxicity quality of life from these um, different regimens. I'm going to skip over the statistical design and quickly just go through this for the sake of time to show that the arms in the trial were, you know, really equally matched. Um, the patients on average were, um, you know, about 60 years old. And I want to point out here that um, about 50%, slightly over 50% of these patients had visceral metastasis, which means cancer that spread to like the lungs or the liver, not just in the bone. Um, there was only a small percentage of patients that had triple negative disease. And for most of these patients, two thirds of the patients, um, this was their first line of chemotherapy. For about a third of the patients, it was they'd had one or more prior chemotherapy uh, drugs. And um, now my computer has frozen. So there we go. So the primary endpoint was looking at something called progression free survival, which means what are the chances the patient is going to be alive without recurrence or, I mean, sorry, without progression of the cancer. And looking at the seven day on, seven day off, the median progression free survival was 8.7 months. And with the standard dosing was 12 months. Um, however, this was not statistically significant. So even though it was numerically longer, it was not statistically significant. And one of the things that the um, presenters pointed out was that if you look at these curves, they actually crossed each other. So this blue curve is the patients that got the seven day on, seven day off. And the green curve is the patient that got the 14 days on and seven days off. And so if you look at the 50% mark, that means the you know 50% of the patients, the median uh, time that the patients progressed, it was longer in the standard dosing. But if you, they did this fancy thing called area under the curve where they actually calculated the percentage of patients that were um, alive without progression of disease. And that's, um, you know, this value here. And they found that there was actually no statistically significant difference between these two approaches. It's a little bit of um, statistical fancy mumbo jumbo, but the bottom line is that it seemed that because the um, fixed dosing of seven days on and seven days off was more tolerable, there were a, a higher percent of patients, as you can see here, this curve kind of going out and the tail here, more patients were actually able to stay on the drug for longer. Um, they looked at these um, three month, 12 month and 24 and 36 month progression free survival. And you can see that they're very equivalent for the three months. So statistical, no, not statistically significantly different. Um, there was a slightly higher um, rate of being um, progression free at 12 months in the standard arm, but then it evened out at the 24 month mark again. And then there were a small number of patients who were on this fixed dosing that were still progression free at 36 months. The response rates were a little bit higher in the standard dosing arm. Um, and then the overall survival, which is really something that we you know, pay a lot of attention to, obviously um, that's most patients are very interested in being alive, 
um, there was actually no statistically significant difference. And in fact, it favored the fixed dosing arm. Um, I'm just going to skip over this for the sake of um, just to talk about, you know, what is most important, I think, in this study is looking at the differences in side effects in that patients that had the fixed dose of um, 1500 milligrams twice a day, rather than the higher dose um, at 14 days on and seven days off had a much lower rate of any diarrhea. So 20% versus 62% much lower rate of hand foot syndrome, 21% versus 53%, less mouth sores, you know, three versus 27%, and about the same amount of neutropenia. So overall, it was really um, remarkable how much better the seven day on seven day off schedule was. Looking at the percentage of patients that underwent treatment discontinuations or dose modifications, they were also significantly in favor of the fixed dosing seven days on seven days off. So their conclusions were that in this fixed dosing um, design of seven days on, seven days off, there was similar efficacy with no differences in progression-free survival. There was lower hand foot syndrome, diarrhea, and mouth sores, fewer discontinuations and dose modifications. And so the takeaway message for me is that so many of my patients will ask me when I, you know, when they're, they're starting with a 14 days on and seven days off, which is what I tend to start with. Um, because it is the FDA approved dosing schedule that when we either dose reduce or we drop down to a seven day on seven day off schedule, you know, I feel much more comfortable, even though this is a small study, you know, the total, you know, number of patients, you know, is, is, you know, less than a hundred. If we look here, you know, less than a hundred in each arm. So it is a small study, um, but it does provide, you know, me some confidence that I feel much more comfortable telling patients that they can reduce the dose. Um, so I'll stop there and, and see if anyone else had any other thoughts or comments about, you know, this presentation, which I, I thought was a very practical study. No, I think it's great that we were able to finally get this data. Memorial Sloan Kettering had looked at a fixed higher dose one week on, one week off, and published a little tiny bit of data, but there's never been any randomized trial data. So it was amazing that they were able to pull this off. And I think what's important for everybody who's listening to know also is that the group that did this was out of Kansas. Uh, and the uh, sort of surrounding sites, but you know they don't. There's no pharma funding for this because it's a generic drug, right? So it's no longer a. Um, it's off patent essentially. So uh, they had to generate funding to do the trial. So that's why it's so small. They also allowed any number of lines of treatment, but 70% of patients were treated in the first line chemotherapy uh, approach. So uh, Joe, do you use the seven and seven approach and do you use a fixed dose or do you calculate? Um, I do use a seven on seven off. I generally will start with the standard dosing of two weeks on one week off um, using the height and weight BSA for the actual dose. And, and I see how the patient tolerates it. Um, I do have many patients who actually tolerate it just fine. And, and if that's the case, I stay with it. But um, over time, many patients do develop more hand foot syndrome, um, GI symptoms, and, and they do switch over to seven on, seven off. And even you know before this data, I, I can say that I, I have found that patients can do quite well. And oftentimes, but by the time I've switched, I've already had some assessment of how they're responding, right? Oftentimes I'm getting scans at two or three months and I'm already seeing that they're responding. And so going from a two on one off to a seven on seven off, after you know that the disease is responding, I find that those patients can continue to respond with that change in schedule. And that's reassuring. And this trial just reinforces that. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, do you use 2,500 milligrams per meter squared though? I start out um, in general with 2,000 milligrams per meter squared in the I late stage setting. I use 2,500 milligrams per meter squared when I'm forced to in a clinical trial and then, you know, we dose right. reduce. So I have started some patients at a week on, a week off, particularly my older patients, um, patients who um, have a lot of side effects, you know, I, I'm not as worried about getting an urgent response, et cetera. What about you, Laura? Um, I'm, I agree completely. I feel like I generally start people 14 days on, seven days off, but have a low threshold to switch over to seven and seven, especially in my older patients. Um, and if people are not tolerating it, like has been said, 
Um, and I think this data, I think patients sometimes worry that switching over or dose reducing, um, they have some anxiety about that. And so I think this data is reassuring and helpful for patients to have this information for sure. I think one of the big things that our patients, you know, we have, it's actually really interesting. There's a subset like 0.1% or something of the population who do not metabolize um, capecitabine into its inactive metabolite. Um, it's first metabolized into something active and there are several active metabolites. And then if it doesn't get broken down again, you can get life-threatening toxicity, but thankfully that's extraordinarily rare. But there's a whole group of people who are intermediate metabolizers that we don't identify. So we're often messing around with the dose because of side effects. UCSF now can do a pharmacogenomics panel and look to see how uh, patients metabolize the drug, but it's not perfect. Nothing it really is. And we don't really know how to adjust the dose for the metabolism. So it's difficult and we don't actually, nobody really has the idea about these intermediate metabolizers. I think the biggest, um, the biggest uh, issue that we all face is the hand foot syndrome or redness of the palms and soles that can be really um, painful. Um, there was a study, Michelle, in uh, about diclofenac uh, gel. Uh, people also have used heparin gel, but I don't think there's much on that. But um, uh, Kelly Shanahan asks in the chat about the diclofenac gel, which I now I'm giving to everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, just, you know, quickly, there was a, a, a small study that looked at using this diclofenac gel. Patients were randomized to a placebo gel um, versus this diclofenac gel, which they applied twice a day. And they looked at the rates of hand foot syndrome um, at, you know, baseline, you know, presumably, I, I have to be honest with you, I didn't have the slides in front of me. So I don't know exactly, you know, when, if a patient had to um, start this exactly when they started the Cape Cytobine, but they looked at hand foot syndrome at four weeks and at 12 weeks, and it was dramatically reduced um, among those patients that were getting um, the diclofenac gel. And it was a double blinded study. Um, so this was a trial of 263 patients. Um, so evenly split between the you know, topical diclofenac gel. Um, this was both breast cancer patients as well as patients with GI malignancies because um, gastric colon cancer and colon cancer also do get capecitabine. And um, at 12 weeks, the incidence of grade two or higher hand foot syndrome was 4% in the diclofenac arm it compared to 15% um, in, the, um, in the placebo arm. And um, they looked at, uh, you know, they looked at different subgroups. They compared males and females. Um, there were more females in the study. Um, they also, there was a significantly lower percentage of patients that had to have capecitabine dose reduced when they were taking the diclofenac. Um, the adherence to both products was very good, 96% with a diclofenac, 94% with a placebo. So it didn't seem like the drug was causing a lot of symptoms. Um, so I have to say that I myself have not yet um, you know, utilize this because I, for whatever reason, I've been fortunate that I haven't had patients that have had a uh, significant, um, you know, I have the pay, I haven't had any new Cape Cetabine starts um, since ASCO because I've been on vacation for a couple of weeks since that time. And I've had patients that have already had received um, and had been tolerating the Cape Cetabine and they're like, I don't want to bother with it. Um, but I'm just curious if anyone else. So I hope you've seen pretty good results so far personally. No, I can't say that I've seen good results, but I've told a lot of people to use it. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's recent, you know, obviously. And so, um, the trial was called the torch trial. If people want to look it up. Uh, but I think it was really, and it was done in India, which is really interesting. Um, I think, uh, it's just a fascinating, uh, study because it makes a lot of sense for me to use a topical anti-inflammatory, uh, and maybe it could be a use for diclofenac, which I have to say doesn't work all that well for joint pain. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, they had, um, I think, uh, you know, didn't get that high a dose, but they definitely saw, as you, you know, noted, the grade two or higher hand foot syndrome was 15% for placebo and uh, clofenac 3.8%. It's huge. So anyway, um, and then some people just never got high grade hand foot syndrome. So I figure that's over the counter. It's really easy. You know, we tell everybody to use cold soaks and, you know, urea cream and this and that. And this is just one addition that may really help a lot. So worthwhile thinking about. Um, I just okay. want to mention that someone in the chat asked about whether there was a place um, that the public can access all the data published at ASCO. And I was going to reply privately, but I 
you know, just mention that, you know, as far as I know, um, you know, you have to have a login and pay some amount of money to get all of the actual, you know, slides and presentations to watch. But there are many sources um, that can summarize many of the, res the results that are publicly available. Um, I, I wasn't sure, hope you know a lot more about the um, logistics of, you know, access and cost for um, patients and patient advocates um, that I, I yeah, think there's a there's certainly um, some discount, but I um, one of the things that you can do is freely access the abstracts and um, then if so, if you're looking at the abstracts and you want to see something more, you can also look on Google because like people, there's like so much that's posted on there, you know, all the different ASCO news and this and that, that have talked about the different studies that generally we're seeing. Now, obviously it's not all of everything that was submitted to ASCO, but there's a lot in there. Um, if you start searching different things that you want to look at once you've seen the abstracts. The ASCO Daily News, which is free, is a nice place to start to just look at some of the summaries of data. Um, they interview people. Obviously, it's selective, but I think it is really um, a nice place to start that's free. So um, so let's go on and um, talk about, um, I guess, because we're going to try and get Michelle going since she has a family obligation, but um, one other trial, which was this interesting approach of trying to you know figure out which patients needed more or less treatment for her two positive breast cancer. Sure. So I will share my screen again, and um, hopefully it won't take too long. So I think you know we're we're all quite familiar with um, the fact that you know her two positive breast cancer has been you know really you know remarkable disease in that we have really changed the natural history of, you know, what was once a really, you know, devastating disease um, to, let's see if my slides are going to pop over. There we go. Um, to something that has become very treatable. And we know that, um, you know, the, the assessment of response for an early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, where we give chemotherapy or some form of treatment before surgery, um, can provide us a lot of information about a patient's prognosis. And so it's really, except for the really smallest um, HER2 positive breast cancers, you know, we tend to give a lot of chemotherapy and HER2 targeted therapies before surgery. So the question though, is we, we do often ask if we have a patient who has a small HER2 positive cancer um, or, you know, for whatever reason might have some comorbidities or some reason why they might not want to get sort of the full court press chemotherapy, um, whether we need to give, you know, six cycles of taxotere, carboplatin, Herceptin, and Progetta. We've certainly already done a lot of dose de-escalation with chemotherapy um, in that, you know, when I first started, you know, you know, 20 years ago, uh, when, when Herceptin, these drugs were first, you know, being used in early stage disease, almost everybody got an anthracycline containing regimen. Now we've scaled back and are trying to giving only an anthracycline containing regimen to the most, most high risk of these patients. Most patients start getting um, TCHP, but there may be a subset of patients that don't need that. And so this trial actually asked this question. And so it's kind of a complicated trial design, but I'll try to walk you through it. Um, these are patients that had... Um, HER2 positive breast cancer that could be anywhere between stage one and stage three disease. They had to have a tumor diameter that was at least 1.5 centimeters so they could actually, you know, relatively accurately re assess response. And the lesion in the breast had to be actually a valuable by PET scan. And so patients, um, we're going to focus on these two groups here, group A and group B. There were patients in group A that were randomized in a one to four uh, ratio. So there was quite a few patients that were randomized into this experimental ratio. The standard group would get two cycles of the standard chemotherapy regimen that we often give for um, a locally advanced HER2 positive breast cancer. They would get two cycles of taxotere, carboplatin, Herceptin, Pergetta. And then the other group, the group B, would start off getting um, just the Pergetta and the Herceptin, so the antibody therapy alone. And this ETX means that these patients um, that were randomized this arm would get endocrine therapy. Um, so this would be appropriate for patients um, uh, who were um, ER positive. So these patients were just to mark out that these are patients that would eventually get endocrine therapy if they were hormone receptor positive. After two cycles of this, so this is given, each cycle is given once every three weeks, patients underwent a PET scan, a total potty PET scan. They also had some tumor and blood tissue and blood samples taken. And those patients that were on randomized to start with THP continued on with additional TCHP, but based on the results of the PET scan here, patients whose tumor showed a response 
would actually continue on this antibody only approach for six more cycles. And if they had no response on the PET scan, they would go on to get the standard TCHP. Then the patients would go to surgery and then the people who are in the standard arm would just go on and get their Herceptin Progetta and endocrine therapy. However, if patients who were in this experimental arm who'd had a response on the PET, if they had a pathologic complete response, they would never get chemotherapy. And then those patients that did not get a pathologic complete response would go on and get the standard chemotherapy. And then those patients that had um, the TCHP preoperatively would go on and get the per Herceptin Progetta postoperatively. So I must mention here, the design here is, of course, you know, things are constantly changing in breast oncology, so that if you looked at this group here that got TCHP pre-op and this, that both of this group here and this group here, in the current era, if they went to surgery and did not get a path CR, they would actually not just continue on with a Herceptin Progetta, they would actually be getting um, additional treatment with CADSILA, but this trial was very likely started in design before that became the standard of care. Um, so this is another way to break it down, just looking at, again, this arm here to focus on group B. There's two arms that we're going to focus on or talk about in group B, those that had um, started off with the um, antibody therapy only. And this is an example of a PET scan. You can see here, this is an axillary lymph node, and this is based on PET. You can see over after two cycles of the Herceptin and Progetta, that little area, that node, and the circle here is no longer evident. So that was considered a response and that patient stayed on the Herceptin Progetta. However, here there's a patient that has a breast mass and axillary node and there was no response. So they went on to get chemotherapy. So just to give you a visual of what's happening um, in this trial to these patients. Um, and so I'm going to, now we're going to jump backwards to talk about, again, the eligibility criteria, you know, stage one to three invasive breast cancer patients um, could not have evidence of metastatic disease. Um, there were patients that were allowed to participate if they had what was called subclinical M1 um, metastatic disease at one site by PET, but we're not going to talk about those patients. Um, I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time, but the primary endpoint was looking at the pathologic complete response rate in those patients who were assigned to start with the antibody therapy only and who responded to the PET scan. So these are patients who never got chemotherapy before surgery. So we want to see what the path CR rate. They were also comparing this to the path CR rate in all patients. Um, and then they were also looking at toxicity. Um, and so uh, I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time. And this is a bunch of statistical mumbo jumbo that we'll, uh, we'll ignore. Um, but just to see the breakdown of how these patients, the flow of these patients, they started randomization in June 2017 and completed it in April 2019. So again, that was pre when we started using um, CADSILA as their standard of care post-operatively. And so we had um, in group A, the standard patients, about 71 patients that were allocated to get the standard arm of chemotherapy. Everybody got chemo plus Herceptin Progetta. And there was 285 patients that were starting off with the antibody therapy only. The groups were very well matched. Um, there was uh, predominantly, you know, there were about 50% premenopausal patients. They all had very high performance status and the majority of the patients um, had stage two disease. Um, about 50% were, um, most of them, 50% were node negative. There was about 40, 45 to 50% that were node positive. And you can see here um, that about two thirds were hormone receptor positive as well. And so this breaks down, you know, the group of patients that were in group B, um, about 20% of them were considered PET non-responders and 79% were considered responders by PET. And among this entire group, the pathologic complete response rate was 40%. So just to give you some context um, for the standard, you know, pathologic complete response rate for patients getting six cycles of taxotere, carboplatin, Herceptin, Progetta ranges in studies, but on average is about 60 to 65%. So this is numerically lower um, but again, these patients are not getting any chemotherapy. Um, and so what is really important here um, and, you know, kind of the punchline of the study is what is the pathologic complete response rate for patients um, that were in group B? And this includes patients who received both 
only endocrine or not only antibody therapy. So the PET responders, patients whose tumors responded after two cycles of the Herceptin Progetta, and it also includes those patients who flipped over and did get chemotherapy because they didn't respond. But the three-year invasive disease-free survival rate was very high, 95%. And then looking at some of the other endpoints, um, so now we're looking at the number of relapses. So, you know, 95% of patients are alive without invasive recurrence at three years. There were um, eight patients out of this group who did have a distant recurrence. So out of those 4.5% of recurrences, 3% of them were distant recurrences. Um, this is a complicated slide, but then they looked at those people in group B who did get a pathologic complete response rate. So whether or not they got chemotherapy in the end or not, the invasive disease-free survival was exceedingly high. Out of 86 patients, only one patient had a recurrence. So this tells us that you know, this strategy where we might be able to give a certain percentage of patients an opportunity to get by without chemotherapy is actually, you know, does end up with very good outcomes if a patient achieves a pathologic complete response. Um, going through looking at the groups. So this is the standard arm, you know, six cycles of TCHP, 98% of patients alive without an invasive recurrence at three years. And you can see across the board, group B overall, 95%. And those group B patients who had a good response on their first PET scan, who never needed chemotherapy, had a very similar invasive disease-free survival at three years. Um, just looking at this, the things I want to point out to you are those patients, of course, as you'd expect in group B, the dark blue who did not get chemotherapy, you can see they had a much lower rate of serious adverse events. Um, I'm going to skip over this for the sake of time, but you can just tr trust me to say that, of course, patients that were in the arm that did not get chemotherapy had significantly lower side effects across the board. And so basically, the this study showed that um, in patients in group B who were sort of tested to see whether they could get by without getting chemotherapy, um, that the invasive disease-free survival was very high at 95%. And this is actually very comparable to the response rates and the, or the invasive disease-free survival rates we see with patients with, that we get with chemotherapy. Um, and so basically the conclusion was that, that we could actually identify a subset of patients, about one in three patients with HER2 positive breast cancer who might do very, very well without chemotherapy. So I know that's a very, very, you know, quick run through, very busy, busy slide set, but, um, you know, I think it's a very provocative study. Um, patients often ask me, you know, when we talk about the options for getting, you know, treatment of HER2 positive breast cancer, um, up until this study, you know, again, this is, I think, in some ways, practice changing for me to say that we did not have really strong data to offer someone to start with hormone or to start with um, antibody therapy and to see how they would do without chemotherapy. So I'm curious to know if my colleagues are, you know, for those patients who, you know, have some, you know, significant aversion to chemotherapy or who are very, very, um, you know, uh, you know, have other risk factors or other factors that would make us not want to give them chemotherapy, if they would do this. Right. So just to answer one of the questions that's in the chat live, the difference between HER2 2 plus and 3 plus. Um, and this trial used the classic uh, definition of HER2 positivity that uh, was, is um, uh, approved by international guidelines. So either it's 3 plus by immunohistochemistry, meaning that the antibody makes a lot of dark color on the cells. You have a lot of the receptor um, or it's HER2-2+, but there's evidence of HER2 gene amplification. In contrast, now we think about this HER2 low, which is 1+, plus, which is negative, or 2+, plus, um, and if it's 2+, plus, it has to have uh, no evidence of gene amplification. So uh, this study was really to look at a HER2-positive disease. Um, and uh, I think that I'm really interested, maybe, um, Joe, you could talk a little bit about how this, you know, sort of relates to what we are doing in iSpy. Yeah, so um, iSpy is a trial that one of the missions really is to identify novel therapies that are equally or more effective than our standard chemotherapy and also better tolerated. And we're testing these drugs in the neoadjuvant setting and using 
pathologic response as our primary endpoint, since we can get that information in five to six months. Um, and, and so we are using MRI as the primary imaging uh, assessment tool. And, and that has been very, I think, enlightening and, and effective. But I think seeing these data um, from Fergain, I think really is intriguing and whether or not we should be looking at PET um, is really important to ask. We are actually looking at what we call um, a mammy PET using estradiol as a tracer. So there's something called FES mammy PET where it, like in a PET scan in for gain, you're using glucose, sugar, and labeling that with, with a radioactive isotope. And then we know these rapidly dividing cells are um, taking up more glucose in order to divide. And so it's gonna look bright on a PET scan. In um, ER positive tumors, uh, we are looking at using estrogen as the tracer, radio labeling that because we know all these tumors express the estrogen receptor and they'll uptake the estrogen. And can that be um, a, a, an imaging modality to look at response to hormonal treatments? So we're looking at that in the endocrine arm of the iSPY trial right now, where we're studying novel hormone therapies in the neoadjuvant setting. But yes, iSPY has been doing this for a long time, is assessing response to treatment initially with chemo and now with endocrine therapy, using imaging as an early assessment tool to try and predict whether or not the patient is going to get to PCR. Because if they're not, if we, if we can see based on early, early imaging um, endpoints that probably that patient is not going to get to PCR, then we, we want to switch the treatment early and try something different and then image again. And so give patients multiple chances to get to complete response using these early assessments. Yeah, I think that's really uh, well said. And I, I will say that one of the questions that came up is whether this trial would lead to routine pets in HER2 positive early breast cancer, and it won't. Uh, pets are expensive and a lot of radiation, and I think not really practical. So actually, I think that uh, group, the Fergain group, is going to present their data on MRIs uh, at some meeting in the fall, either the European meeting or the San Antonio breast cancer meeting. And I think the issue is that for um MRI, it really depends on having, you know, people who are good at reading it. And that might be a really good way of looking. And in fact, in iSpy, we have some data that if you have this rapid shrinkage at the first MRI, if you do it at one month um, or even a little bit later, but, you know, we tend to do it early, uh, that that rapid response correlates with the overall response that you're going to have, um, whether that's having no invasive cancer at the time of surgery or a pathologic complete response. Um, or whether it's not just having a pretty good response, you know, almost a PCR. Um, and that's being studied because we get a one month uh, MRI now. Um, and the other thing that's being studied is sort of what Fergain was really looking at, but everybody gets chemo. Um, and that is, you know, looking at trying to really personalize the therapy to response, as Joe was mentioning, giving more for people who don't have a cancer that aren't responding, but also giving a lot less for people whose cancers melt away. So it is that idea that Fergain really was looking at giving, you know, trastuzumab, pertuzumab alone for those patients. And it's actually really interesting. I mean, one of the questions also that came up in the chat was whether or not there was a difference based on receptor status. And, you know, a lot of the patients had hormone receptor positive disease, I think somewhere in the 70% range. Um, and uh, they didn't really do that whole division in terms of whether it was more in ER positive or ER negative, because we do see ER negative cancers be more responsive to HER2 targeted therapy in general. So uh, that's a really important question. And um, we don't know the answer to it yet, but maybe we'll see it in the next presentation of this data. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Laura, what's your take on this data? Yeah, I think it's a really, really interesting study. And I think um, all of these studies in the neoadjuvant setting, I think are really cool because it, it gets at that personalization. Um, if we take someone to surgery first, then we're sort of using a cookbook approach, you know, this size, you know, this nodal status, we give this versus if we are able to treat people in the neoadjuvant or before surgery setting, 
we can really alter it and give less to people who need less and give more to people who need more. Um, and I think, as was mentioned, there are many patients who want to try to avoid chemotherapy. And so I think um, this is some, I think for most patients that are younger and healthier, I would still, you know, based on our current guidelines, give chemotherapy with her to directed therapy. Um, but I have a couple of patients actually that are in their 80s or 90s that don't want very clear, they don't want chemotherapy. And I just have on her to directed therapy. And this sort of um, is a trial that gets at that idea. Um, and then potentially in the future, we will be able to really identify which patients don't need chemotherapy and act on that more directly. But I think um, you know, as of now, I still would favor giving the chemo for most patients who can tolerate it, but I think definitely a really compelling idea. And I think as we learn more about how to personalize um, things, we, we can move more in that direction. So it's really exciting. And um, what do you think? I mean, MRI or PET? I mean, I think PETs are a lot of radiation and are expensive, and I don't think will be the way that will clinically, you know, head. Um, I think MRIs probably make more sense and it's what we're using in iSpy. I'll be very interested to see their um, MRI data next to their PET data. Um, I think like what Joe mentioned, the MAMI PET, whether we can use um, more directed forms of PET is an interesting question too. Um, but I think for now, probably MRI makes more sense. Although if we can have a more you know active tracer, that would be cool too. Yeah, I agree. Um, any further thoughts from anybody before we move on? Okay, great. That was really interesting. And I think we'll see a lot more data from this trial uh, from additional endpoints moving forward. And of course, try and understand the who responds or who doesn't. But it is kind of a cool idea that you could give two cycles of something and then, you know, decide on the next treatment based on that response. So anyway, uh, we might uh, move on to the early stage setting. Uh, now, and uh, we're going to talk about, I think, the most, um, I would say, uh, whatever, looked out for data from ASCO this year was from the phase three Natalie trial, looking at adjuvant cyclin dependent kinase inhibitors in patients with moderate to high risk early stage breast cancer. Laura, tell us about Natalie. Great. Let me start from the beginning. Um, great. So um, as Hope mentioned, this was probably the study that most people were interested in seeing the data for at ASCO um, called the NATALIE trial. Um, and what this trial, as, as by way of background, um, we know that patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative breast cancer, um, some of them need chemotherapy, some of them don't, um, that most of these, all of these patients need endocrine therapy. And we know that much for sure that, you know, between five to 10 years of endocrine therapy is really important to reduce the risk of recurrence. Um, but the question is, can we add additional medications to help further reduce the risk in the, our higher risk patients? And so we have this class of medications um, called CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are um, oral medications. There's three different CDK4-6 inhibitors that are approved in breast cancer in the metastatic setting. Um, and we've also been testing these medications in patients with high risk early stage breast cancer. And as many of you know, um, the drug abemocyclib is approved for high risk um, early stage patients. Um, and this trial, the Natalie trial, was looking at a different CDK4-6 inhibitor, ribocyclib, um, for higher risk um, early stage breast cancer patients with hormone receptor positive disease. And notably, um, the Natalie trial included patients that were actually node negative, whereas the Monarch E, the study looking at a bemocyclib, they were all, all of the patients on the study were node positive. So even a slightly lower risk patient population to see if this drug was beneficial. Um, so I kind of explained that background. Um, so looking at the study design, um, so as I mentioned, these were patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, early stage breast cancer um, that could be node negative or node positive, um, but they had to be at least an uh, anatomic stage two um, or stage three disease. Um, they enrolled 5,000 patients, so a very large trial, and randomized these patients one-to-one -one to either get the addition of ribocyclib, the CDK4-6 inhibitor, or to get standard endocrine therapy alone without ribocyclib. And the primary endpoint was looking at invasive disease-free survival, meaning how many patients um, are alive without disease um, at a certain time points. Um, and I think a few things to point out in particular 
Um, like I mentioned before, um, node negative patients, so patients that had stage two disease um, only without any nodal involvement were allowed in this study, which is different than the Monarch E study. They also interestingly um, and importantly um, studied the 400 milligram dose. Um, so in the metastatic setting, um, we typically start with a 600 milligram dose, um, although many patients have to dose reduce to 400 if they have low blood counts or um, you know, other toxicities. Um, and this trial looked starting at the lower 400 milligram dose, which the thought was, can we make it more tolerable for these patients? And um, the other thing to point out is um, this was three years of ribocyclib. Um, as opposed to Monarch E, they looked at a bemocyclib for just two years. So those are some of the differences between those two studies that are important to mention. Um, we sort of covered this, but um, I think the biggest thing is no negative patients were allowed if they met these um, various criteria. Um, they had to have grade three or grade two with um, higher risk features. Oh, sorry. Um, and as you can see here, the, the treatment groups were fairly well balanced. Like I said, it was a very large trial with over 5,000 patients. Um, many of these patients um, had stage two disease. Um, some had stage three, or, or about half and half, really. Um, and uh, there were about 27% um, to 29% of patients with node negative disease. Um, most of the patients um, had had prior endocrine therapy, and many of them had had prior chemotherapy as well. Um, and uh, this was the first reporting of this data at a median follow-up of almost three years. Um, and as you can see, many of the patients still are on this study. We actually participated in this study at UCSF. So thank you to any of you that might have participated yourself. And um, we're really grateful for the patients that helped us um, learn this important information. Uh, but many of these patients are actually still ongoing treatment are still being followed. Um, so um, we'll get more data in the coming years um, with longer follow-up. But the important thing here is that the addition of ribocyclib achieved a highly significant IDFS or disease-free benefit. And so patients that were randomized to get the ribocyclib um, had a lower uh, IDFS rate. So 90.4% um, of them did not have invasive disease or did not have a recurrence versus 87.1%. Um, kind of if you flip the number that makes sometimes a little bit easier to interpret. So 9.6% um, had disease come back in the ribo arm versus, you know, 12.9% in the AI group alone, which was statistically significant. Um, so basically showed that the addition of ribocyclib decreased the rate of recurrent disease, um, which is really, really exciting for um, patients um, as a potentially future option if this is approved. Um, if you look across various subgroups, um, the benefit, this line in the middle is if they're you know, equal, the hazard ratio is one means this uh, either way um, is the same. Going towards the left, it favors the addition of ribocyclib. And as you can see across all of these subgroups, it favors ribocyclib, meaning that regardless of whether or not they were stage two or stage three favors ribocyclib, whether or not they got chemotherapy, um, whether or not they had grade one, two, or three. So all of these subgroups um, generally favored ribocyclin. Um, the node negative status, I'll point out in particular, it does cross over that line of one, but um, it's still on this left side, slightly favoring ribocyclin. I think there's a lot of interest in kind of understanding more about those node negative patients in particular. So we'll have to wait further data there. Also of interest, if you just go back to that slide before you go on, also stage two crosses one. I mean, the median follow-up here for invasive disease-free survival, so no invasive recurrence, was only 28 months. So it was a little shorter than the whole group. And if you look at the node negative population here, it's 285 and 328, but the actual population in your demographic slide was almost 700, was about 700 in both arms. And uh, the caveat, which they have at the little tiny writing in the bottom, is that this was the pathologic stage. So they end up with a much smaller number, interestingly, of patients who are node negative. And I think what that means is that some patients who were registered as being node negative ended up having positive nodes. Um, but I don't totally understand that because we interview our patients after surgery. So I don't know where that discordance came about, but that's what's been explained is that this is the true pathologic stage. And for those patients who have no negative disease, you know, that confidence interval really widely crosses one. So to me, it suggests that the data is like grade one, like stage two, it's just 
too early um, and we don't have enough events, you know, 16 and 28 events is very, very small. Um, and as uh, one of the questions in the chat was just that, you know, what do you think about just as I know this is in the middle of your presentation, but what do you think about the time to recurrence for patients like this who have smaller cancers? And is this really enough time? Yeah, so we definitely need more time. Um, you know, a three-year look, as, as you know, these patients can recur, you know, out to even 20 years. Um, these are higher risk patients, so we tend to see it earlier than 20 years, although you can't see it out that much, but three years is still an early look, especially for the node negative patients. Um, so I definitely think we'll need to get more data on that node negative group and longer follow up on that group, um, the stage two group, the grade one group um, in particular. Um, I'll skip through this a little bit faster. So distant disease-free survival is also really important. So, you know, you can either have a local recurrence or a distant recurrence. Um, and we worry more um, about distant recurrences in particular because that means it's metastatic disease. Um, and here it also favored ribocyclib. So um, fewer patients had distant recurrences in the ribo group than in the AI alone group. And then in terms of overall survival, um, the median follow-up here was only 30 months. Um, and so it was not yet statistically significant, uh, meaning we, they can't yet see a difference, although it's trending towards improvement. Um, but this is definitely, we need longer follow-up here to know um, whether the addition of ribocyclib actually improves survival for these patients. Importantly, um, in terms of side effects, um, you know, any the addition of any drug, of course, causes it can cause more side effects. So really important to look at this um, when we're considering adding something for patients. Um, low blood counts or neutropenia is something that we see on this drug, um, and you can see there was um, fairly high rate of neutropenia, um, including grade three neutropenia. We usually just um, hold the drug longer um, if of the seven day off time. They're still neutropenic. We hold longer, so that's kind of our general. Um, way to work around that, but it's something we have to monitor. Patients are getting a lot more blood draws. Um, we have to watch for um, elevated liver tests on this medication. Um, we have to get um, a look at the heart rhythm. The QTC is something we look for. And then um, this class of medications can cause lung inflammation. Um, and that's something that's really important to watch for. They didn't see, fortunately, any grade three or severe incidences of lung inflammation um, on this trial yet. Um, so in conclusion, um, this Natalie trial met its primary endpoint, um, meaning that it showed that ribocyclib, um, adding it to an aromatase inhibitor or endocrine therapy, um, improved the rate of disease-free survival, invasive disease-free survival. So, and that it was true across the patient subgroup. So adding it um, did help people um, have a longer, um, or reduce the chance of um, disease recurrence in these patients. Um, I think we definitely need longer follow-up, as was mentioned, particularly for those node-negative stage two patients, but in general, um, looking at this over a longer than three-year period. Um, this drug, ribocyclid, is not yet approved, but based on this data, it's um, likely that it will be approved at some point soon, um, and so it will be another option for our patients. Um, abemocyclid, the one that is approved right now, um, I think I still would favor using that in higher risk patients just because we have longer follow-up and more data. Um, but many patients don't tolerate a BEMA, and so having ribo as another option right now is great. And then, of course, you know, ribo, um, like I mentioned before, um, had a broader inclusion criteria. So we, we cannot give a BEMA to no negative patients based on the data, the monarchy data, but we would, in theory, be able to give ribo. And so it potentially could be an, an option for slightly lower risk patients than for the monarch E group. Um, so I think potentially could be a really exciting um, new agent for our, our patients with early stage disease um, to reduce the risk of recurrence. And I'll stop there for questions. That's great. Um, so I'll ask first a, a question just about general. Um, Joe, do you think this data is adequate to lead to approval of ribocyclib? No, not <laughs> as is. Um, this is really early follow-up, and um, even with the Bemacyclib, you know, they first presented their initial presentation, I think was two years 
follow-up, and then subsequently three years and four years. And what was, was reassuring with the Abema Sikliv data in Monarchy is that that benefit, the difference between the two arms, um, the benefit increased every time they presented the data. So um, I think it looked pretty similar at three years as a bemaciclib. I'd like to see what it looks at four years looks like at four years. Um, so so that's critical. The difference is still it's significant, but um, you know the difference we saw at four years for bemaciclib from an absolute standpoint was six to seven percent, um, and and here at three years it's about three percent. And and I just think it's too early. We just need a little bit more follow up. And so uh, what do you think? Uh, one of the questions, uh, Michelle, was that there was a 20% early discontinuation rate due to adverse events. We also saw quite a high, quite similar um, early discontinuation rate early from monarchy. And interestingly, um, we'll hear about that in just a moment, but you know, most people didn't dose reduce before they stopped. So what do you think about the adverse events? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I guess I, I might have a little bit different take in terms of, you know, my takeaway from this is, yes, I think it is it is too early, but if I have a patient who's on a bemacyclib and is miserable, um, of course, I find that, you know, dose reduction, you know, early and not hesitating makes a huge difference. You know, if you make someone suffer with diarrhea with a bemacyclib for a long time, then even when you dose reduce to 100 twice a day, it just seems like their gut is all messed up and it's hard to kind of get things back. Um, so I think the dose discontinuation rate in this is is actually surprisingly high. Um, because again, you know, most times with a ribocyclid, the dose reductions are happening because of blood count suppression. And there's very clear, it's much easier to look at a number and say, okay, their neutrophil count is 900 or 600 or 700 yeah. for this many days. The diarrhea is always hard. I find to quantify because, you know, you ask a patient, you know, how many times they had diarrhea in a day and it's like, okay, they sat on the pot for like, you know, an hour because every Every time they got up, they had another bout of diarrhea. So do you call that one bout of diarrhea or do you call that six? Um, and so I find, you know, patients, I, all in all, I mean, I think when the, this dose discontinuation rate um, is higher than I would have expected based on, you know, my experience with ribocyclib, um, but I think they're equally high and it's problematic with both drugs. And so I think it's just critical that the way to be successful with either of these agents is to dose reduce pretty quickly and not push to stay on that highest dose. So 150 BID, um, you know, for the, you know, for the abemacyclib, I often drop down to hundred. And then this one, of course, you know, started at 400, right? So um, made it more tolerable, but on the patients that I had on the study, I mean, I think we all had one or two patients on the trial, you know, a number of them, you know, did actually drop down to 200. Um, so, yeah. and, and, you know, and it was three years versus two, which is a long time to do this. Yeah. So I think that's the biggest issues for us is this, this doesn't answer the question about the optimal duration. Is it two, three years? Should it really have been longer? But, you know, in drugs that cost, you know, $12,000 a month and have significant side effects, as we mentioned, that's tough for people who, you know, many of whom will already be cured of their cancers, but the risk is high. So it does make it really difficult to bemaciclib. Um, dose reducing can be a little bit more difficult because depending on how you dose reduce, you know, if you have to change from the 150 to 100 milligram tablets, but I agree dose reducing early is really uh, critical. It's just people have a hard time with the diarrhea who get diarrhea. Um, but ribocyclib, you know, a lot of people had a, quite a bit of fatigue and they got really tired. I had one woman who I offered another study to that we have after, you know, you've been on four years of endocrine therapy that you could switch to a different kind who had just finished the Natalie trial. She was like, no, <laughs> I'm not yeah. doing more studies. I'm done with this because people just get tired. You know, uh, they are fatigued. And that is one interesting toxicity from these drugs is just fatigue. Um, and uh, I, it's a, a big question. And our um, experimental pharmacist, Laura Quintal, asks us as a group, what, what considerations would you consider using ribociclib over Um, So let's say that, you know, you already have decided to give the patients who are no negative ribo, right? Because that's where it is. But Laura, which other patients, I mean, would you wait and see how they tolerated Abema or are there patients for whom you would start with ribo? 
Um, I think there are certain patients that I would consider starting ribo if they had a lot of GI toxicity on their chemo or have bowel issues to start with. Um, I'm always a little bit worried about abema in those patients. Um, some patients you read online about abemocyclic diarrhea, they don't want it at all. And so they would say no to abema, but if I had another option, you know, that might be more appealing. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that having a second option is always good. And so um, there are having both options to offer our patients, um, I think is, is a good thing. Yeah, I think so uh, too. Uh, Joe, anything, where would you decide? Well, at this moment, I mean, abemocyclib is the only one that's approved. So I, I would not offer ribocyclib because it, the data is not mature and it's not approved. Um, I will say that for the patients who've had a lot of GI toxicity on abemocyclib, going from 150 twice a day to 100 twice a day actually does improve their symptoms a lot. I've had, and, and more so than you would think by just dropping it 50 milligrams you know, at, at a time. And so I, I really always encourage my patients to try the dose reduction. I would say the vast majority can do can stay on it and, and do well and can stay complete the two years. Yeah, that's been my experience. You know, the other thing, because I mean, Michelle was talking about how some people just couldn't tolerate treatment, either kind of treatment, but you know, once they have seen positive results, and then you keep reminding them of the positive results and the decreased distant recurrence or metastatic disease, people, I think, stay on more. Uh, but we do need to learn to manage these side effects and um, think about also, you know, for some of our patients, the share of costs, particularly patients with Medicare, as long as we still have Medicare, um, is, uh, you know, it's really a big issue. So uh, we're, I think, all working within our systems as best as possible to provide the most options. Yeah. And I, you know, and I think another question that will come up and, and where the share of costs question will come up again is, you know, if the Natalie trial as the data mature and, and we see that the benefit, you know, continues and this drug gets approved and it's a three-year course, what are we going to do with all the patients who have been on a bemocyclib um, <laughs> with the plan for two years? Right, I can envision the questions that are going to arise. Are we going to extrapolate from the Natalie trial and just continue the abemocyclib for three years, and 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 versus switching to ribocyclib at that point, right? Which probably would be would not make sense either. But I think this will be a clinical question that's going to come up a lot. I heard somebody already messaged me that question, actually. <laughs> Should they stop at two years? And it's tough, you know, when you have a lot of cancer and the risks are really high, it's tough to know exactly what to do. Um, let's briefly talk about the age, uh, you know, how these drugs work in older versus younger patients. Um, uh, somebody asked earlier about what is older? Is it, oh, is it 65 or older or is it 75 or older? How do you decide? In this study, a lot of people do break it down by 65, and that's not because we think that people are old and decrepit at 65, but it's because there are few people who, once you get to be over 75, so you can't do the study. <laughs> so it's more a practical uh, component than not. Um, awesome. So this is um, the Monarch E study, which is one we've actually just been referring to, so helpful to look at them back to back. Um, but as mentioned, this was specifically an analysis looking at it by age, which I think is really interesting and important since we do have a lot of older patients that we're using to treat. So as a reminder, this is this study looked at node positive early breast cancer um, and was designed to evaluate the addition of two years of adjuvant abema to endocrine therapy. Um, and uh, based on this data, this drug is approved, as was mentioned, and it is a drug that we're all using right now. Um, but as of uh, until this data, we didn't really know the outcomes yet by age. Um, but here, first, just looking at it briefly, the invasive disease-free survival, the abemocyclib is in red, and the endocrine therapy alone is in blue. And you can see the separation of the curves there, showing that even as over time, actually, as was mentioned, the benefit widened. These curves got further apart with more follow-up, um, and there's a 6.4% um, benefit um, with the abemocyclib in terms of invasive disease-free survival and distant recurrence-free survival of 5.9 at four years. So um, really nice data that's only gotten better over time. And that's um, why this drug is um, something we're all turning to. Um, this I thought was kind of funny and interesting that looking at the quality of life, they looked pretty similar 
um, a, between abema and endocrine therapy alone, which I have a hard time believing, to be honest, because I feel like there is a difference being on it than not, but it is what the data showed that the, the was quality of life was similar between the two. Our um, tools are not good. <laughs> the tools are not good. That's really what it is. Um, uh, Cause we all know that it's harder to be on it than to not. But um, the interesting part of this analysis was looking at it by age. Um, and so um, I'll just kind of cut to the chase here. Um, so they looked at patients less than 65 and greater than or equal to 65. And there were 850 patients um, that were greater than or equal to 65 in this study. And um, interestingly, looking at um, the numbers by age, um, you could see that in terms of invasive disease-free survival, um, the outcomes were fairly similar in terms of the haz hazard ratio is another way we, we look at um, you know, benefit. Um, and then the four-year um, event rates here, um, they were pretty similar between less than 65 and greater than 65. Um, showing that there is, you know, these patients do do well on this drug and do um, derive benefit from, from this drug in, pull, in terms of both invasive disease-free survival and distant recurrence-free survival. Um, and then importantly, um, you know, we always sort of worry about our older patients in particular, you know, is the diarrhea going to be tolerable? Is it something that um, they can handle that they want to deal with? Um, and in the rates of um, diarrhea, for example, here, grade one, grade two, and grade three is basically getting the least severe to grade three is the most severe. Um, and there was a slightly higher rate of um, grade three diarrhea in greater than or equals 65 to 12 versus seven. But you can see otherwise the numbers are pretty similar in terms of rates of diarrhea. Fatigue, you know, slightly higher percentage of um, grade three fatigue in older patients, but otherwise pretty similar numbers. Um, so the kind of takeaway here is that um, the you know, adverse events were fairly similar between the groups, slightly higher rates of diarrhea, slightly higher rates of fatigue, um, but kind of within um, range of each other in general. Um, older patients did have slightly higher rates of drug interruption and dose reductions um, and discontinuation as well. Um, you can see the numbers here for greater than or equal to 65 are higher than those for less than 65. Uh, many of these patients discontinued without dose reduction, as was mentioned several times, we are quick to dose reduce if we need to, to help people stay on these drugs. Um, one thing I think was particularly interesting about this study was looking at relative dose intensity for of those patients that needed to dose reduce, um, how did they do? Um, and quite helpfully, actually, this showed that the, even the patients that needed to dose reduce still benefited from the drug. Um, and I, you know, whenever I have to dose reduce a patient, patients always worry, am I still getting the benefit from the drug? Is it still working as well? And so this data is helpful to have in our back pocket to say, actually, you know, the patients that did need a dose reduction still benefited from the drug. Um, and so it gives me more confidence, um, even more confidence in um, if I need to dose reduce um, that um, not only will it help their patient's symptoms, but they'll also still derive um, benefit from the drug. Um, and so the takeaways here are um, consistent treatment benefit across age groups um, with clinically meaningful reduction in both invasive disease-free survival and distant recurrence-free survival in both younger and older patients. Um, adverse event rates were fairly similar, although higher dose reductions and treatment discontinuations in older patients. Um, and I think importantly, the patients who needed a dose modification had similar IDFS rates. And so um, it's helpful for us to have that information. If we need to dose reduce patients, um, it's um, actually, hopefully they'll get the same benefit that they would have. Um, and quality of life per these metrics was per, um, preserved in both groups. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really, it was, I don't think it would have been an oral necessarily as the podium, except for to go, you know, be next to Natalie. It was kind of nice grouping, uh, but it's nice to see, you know, it helps you a little bit with the dose reduction. So the one question I'll ask before we go on to Joe's uh, session part is uh, that would you uh, start an older patient with high risk disease at a lower dose of abemaciclib? So let's say you have a, you know, 78 year old who has, you know, six positive nodes or, you know, in a big lobular cancer, um, would, where, where would be the dividing line and would you consider starting at a lower dose, Joe? 
Yeah, I I would um, in patients, and it's not just age, right? I, I think patients who have other medical issues and um, or even other circumstances that would make it difficult to manage the diarrhea uh, up front, I, I would start a little bit lower knowing that if they do well, we can escalate, we can increase the dose just like we can decrease the dose. And, you know, I do believe that if one has a very difficult time up front, sometimes patients are just done like that, you know, they would rather just stop than, than try a lower dose. So in order to avoid that situation for patients who might um, might have a harder time, I do sometimes start lower knowing we can go up if needed. One of the questions in the chat is, you know, for roast reduced patients do equally well, wouldn't it be better to start everybody? And that's actually a big question. That was just an $11 million PCORI grant given to ASCO and a few of our colleagues uh, to really understand alternative dosing schedules because of this expanding use in the early stage setting that we expect from uh, Natalie over time. But right now, you know, for patients who aren't young, who aren't old, who don't have comorbidities, who don't have reasons to start lower, starting on the full dose is almost like a test of how you metabolize the drug, right? So if you start at a lower dose, then you may not be giving the right dose to everybody because of differences in metabolism. Michelle, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it gets back to what do you call old? Um, and, you know, and, and it's all about, you know, personality and how, how beat up someone is in the adjuvant setting also from chemotherapy. Um, so I try to start everybody at full dose unless I'm talking about somebody. So I think old, um, you know, I, at this point define it as 75 or older. Um, you know, I have these patients now that I'm, you know, seeing patients down in San Mateo, you know, who are, you know, 84 and playing golf every day. And, you know, they're, they're like so fit and hiking and craziness. So I think that, um, you know, for me, you know, there's, we just don't see that many 68 year olds who are very unfit right? I don't see that many. I see mostly healthy people um, that come into their breast cancer pretty healthy. So I think I try to start at full dose, um, except for, you know, maybe somebody who is, you know, multiple, multiple comorbidities, who's really beat up from chemotherapy. And, you know, there may be some younger patients that I will start, you know, because I have had the experience where, you know, someone who just has a horrible, you know, terrible, you know, month of diarrhea on the higher dose, they just are done. They just can't do it anymore. Even if you try to convince them to drop down. And I agree dropping down to a hundred makes a huge difference. But, um, so mostly I try to start at the full dose, except for, I would say 75 and older. Yeah. I think that that seems really reasonable unless somebody's really opposed. You can always reduce the dose and you can always go back up as Joe said. So Joe, let's move into metastatic disease. Um, there was a really interesting trial looking at when we should be giving CDK4-6 inhibitors and another trial looking at sequential CDK4-6 inhibitors. Let's start with Sonia. Okay. Okay, perfect. So um, as Hope mentioned, the the question that this trial Sonia really wanted to answer is whether or not CDK4-6 inhibitors have to be started in the first line setting. Um, just a little bit of background for the audience. There are three approved CDK4-6 inhibitors for metastatic or advanced breast cancer, ribociclib, abemaciclib, palbociclib. And the approval came from phase three studies, basically showing equivalent efficacy in their ability to control metastatic disease in both the first line setting and the second line setting. And what that means is first line setting means when patients are initially diagnosed with metastatic disease, adding the CDK4-6 inhibitor as, as part of the first treatment um, is better than just doing the hormone therapy by itself. Um, in addition, as we just heard, abemaciclib is approved for patients in the early stage setting who's at high risk of uh, recurrence. As we've also heard, CDK4-6 inhibitors are associated with additional side effects, drops in blood counts, diarrhea, fatigue. So if it doesn't need to be started in the first line setting, um, and it, it can be added in the second line setting and patients can potentially still benefit from it, perhaps that could spare many patients that upfront toxicity from these side effects. 
So again, the purpose is comparing first line CDK4-6 inhibitor with hormone therapy versus adding it in the second line. And the main question is, do all patients need to start the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line, which is the current standard of care? So this trial was a phase three trial. It enrolled over a thousand patients and these were pre and postmenopausal. They all had metastatic disease. They did not receive um, any prior treatment for their metastatic disease. They could have received chemo um, in the early stage setting. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either getting the aromatase inhibitor, which is the standard hormone therapy, with a CDK4-6 inhibitor, and which one is up to the provider. They didn't assign the CDK4-6 inhibitor, although most of them got halbocyclob because that's the one that was first approved. Um, randomized to that versus just the AI alone. And then followed those patients. And at the time that those patients' disease progressed, they were then switched to a different hormone therapy, fulvestrant, which is a standard second-line hormone therapy. And if they had received the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting, they got just the fulvestrant by itself. And had they not gotten the CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting, they got the CDK4-6 inhibitor with the standard second line fulvestrant. And then they followed those patients still until they had their second progression. So you'll see this PFS2, which is the time until the second progression, okay? So they wanted to see, was PFS2, meaning if you add the time that the disease con was controlled in the, the first time plus the second time, was that different whether you got the CDK4-6 inhibitor up front or later when you progressed after first line? They also looked at quality of life. They looked at how patients, how long patients lived and cost effectiveness, which they did not present um, in, in this initial presentation. So these, here's the breakdown of the patients, um, over 500 in each arm. Uh, most were postmenopausal, and about 35% were newly diagnosed, meaning these are patients who had metastatic disease at the time of their initial diagnosis. Um, the other majority population was patients who had uh, more than two years of what we call disease-free interval, meaning at least two years between the time that they had early stage disease and diagnosis of metastatic disease. Okay, um, and then you can see over 90% had palbociclib as their uh, first line. So this is um, looking at the time to the first progression. And we, this is no surprise. We know that adding a CDK4-6 inhibitor to an aromatase inhibitor in the first line setting is better. You're gonna have longer disease control than if you just give an AI. That we've known from other phase three studies that led to the approval of these three CDK4-6 inhibitors. So no surprise there. You can see the actual numbers of 20, about 25 months when you add the CDK4-6 upfront versus 16 months. Um, with the AI alone. And that is very similar to what we've seen in other, in, in the initial phase three trials that led to their approval. So here is what we're really interested in, which is the difference in PFS2, meaning the time to the, at, after the um, switch, right? The time of the second progression after you've switched. And what you can see is that whether you started first line CDK4-6, um, for, or second line, meaning you waited to add the CDK4-6 until after that first progression. There was no statistically significant difference in PFS2. And then this table on the right is trying to find, you know, a subgroup of patients that maybe did benefit from one approach versus the other. And for the most part, you can see that there really wasn't one group that deviated from the other. So really, um, in general, all the patients, really, there, there was no significant difference whether you started the CDK4-6 up front or at the time of the first progression. The um, authors looked at quality of life, which is a really important component of the study. And again, they used the FACT-B questionnaires, which we saw from the Monarchy study. And um, over eight, so about 87% completed the surveys in both arms. That's a good response rate. So that's um, you know, reliable data. And there was really no difference 
in quality of life between the two groups, whether you start the CDK46 upfront or later, overall quality of life was similar. Um, there was no new safety data. We know we knew the toxicities already with neutropenia, liver function tests, blood count drops. Um, but what was interesting is if you look at the total time a patient was on a CDK46 inhibitor, as you would expect, if you start it upfront, you're going to stay on that CDK46 inhibitor for nearly 25 months over two years. If you wait and start it in the second line, your the total time on CDK46 was 8.4 months. So you're on it for you know a year and a half more if you start it in the first line. And what that translates to, which is the last bullet point here, which is that there were the, there were 42% more high grade toxicities when you use CDK46 in the first line. And that's not too surprising because the longer you're on it, the more likely you're going to have side effects. So the conclusion from the authors was that um, there was adding for CDK46 inhibitors in the first line did not improve progression-free survival, meaning the time of disease control from um, in, after the second progression. Um, it did not. It also didn't approve, improve the total time uh, patients were uh, alive and it did not improve quality of life. It extended the total time of CDK4-6 inhibitor use. And as a, as a result, there were, were more toxicities. So I wanted to um, put this in context. It is, does this mean that we shouldn't start CDK4-6 inhibitors upfront? Um, I would say that is not my conclusion from this study. And one of the main reasons for that is that Giving fulvestrin alone as second line therapy is not probably the optimal second line therapy. And so we can't really say that, you know, waiting to start the CDK46 inhibitor and giving it in the second line is equivalent to giving it in the first line, because likely we are going to give fulvestrin plus another targeted therapy, or there are many novel hormone therapies that are currently in development, um, or most recently we've approved elastostrin for ESR1 mutants. And so the study also didn't, didn't show what, uh, what the molecular profiles were for the patients, because we know that some patients who have, for example, a PIK3CA mutation or ESR1, like I mentioned, should be on something better than fulvestrin alone. And so I think that second line therapy in this trial was not what we would currently give as standard of care, as the optimal standard of care. And therefore assessing the total survival or the total progression-free survival too is not a fair comparison. 90% um, of the patients received palbociclib uh, in this trial. As was mentioned before, palbociclib um, was similar to ribociclib in terms of progression-free survival. However, it has not been shown to improve overall survival like ribociclib. And whether or not we would have seen something different had we used ribociclib upfront is unknown. Are there differences between those two CDK4-6 inhibitors? Unknown. And um, as I was alluding to, you know, is there a subgroup that where we can delay CDK4-6 inhibitors? Um, when they looked at the subset, the clinical subsets, age, nodal, you know, disease, extent of disease, et cetera, they couldn't really pull out a group that maybe could delay more than others. They all sort of look the same. Um, but, you know, what this data tells me is that if there is a reason why we cannot give CDK4-6 inhibitors upfront, because of patients' other, you know, medical issues or tolerance, um, that I'm reassured. I'm reassured that you know maybe they will be okay. We can add it in in the second line once the other issues resolve. Um, so, in my opinion, the current standard is still to add CDK46 inhibitors upfront in the first line. Um, hopefully, and there's a lot of work that going into find biomarkers that can help us potentially pull out the group that might be okay, who have very endocrine sensitive disease that might be okay starting upfront with just 
hormone therapy. But for now, adding the CDK46 inhibitor would be um, is my it's the standard of care, and it's what I would do in the clinic. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really I I completely agree, and we've talked about this a lot, and I think that it is really uh, really an interesting study, but had some issues with it as well. I mean, I think we all think so. Um, uh, what about you? Uh, I know, Michelle, you're gonna have to drop off, so we will ask you quickly, what was your take on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with everything that's been said. I mean, for sure, though, I think when we're, you know, really the biggest concern is that they didn't have the optimal second line therapy, that what is being done, you know, giving single agent Basildex is what we would not do, is not what we do in the United States. But I think it is a critical question about cost. And, you know, there, there's something we just can't ignore, especially if you have a patient that has a very high share of cost for one of these medications. And I think we all have some, you know, is that if a patient is, you know, facing spending, you know, a thousand dollars or even 600, $800 a month out of pocket, um, and, and it's going to, you know, significantly impact their quality of life. And, you know, maybe they can, I, I, I wonder, you know, the, the idea, maybe we'll be looking at some time down the road, time to third progression. You know, what if we, you know, gave someone, you know, the uh, aromatase inhibitor up front and then second line, they get, you know, AI or Fazlodex with an, uh, you know, a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And then third line, they get a novel agent, like a Protac degrader, you know, something like that, you know, maybe we'll right. see. And if somebody's, somebody's starting off 78, 80 years old, you know, I'm not sure that we are going to care that much, you know, like what's going to happen. Are they going to, I just, I, I think that that being a little bit more pragmatic, that there are definitely a higher percentage of patients that I will discuss the option of no hormone therapy when patients are just really focused on quality of life. Um, so again, in this case, I said 75 is older. I think now we're talking about maybe 80 year olds, like 80 year olds. I'm going to use this in with or, a single you know, bone lesion, you know, I mean, there's yeah, a, yeah. That's also a burden of disease makes a big a, difference a too, picture right? of very endocrine sensitive disease where, you know, somebody might stay on for eight or nine years on just their first line endocrine therapy, but we don't see as many of those patients anymore because we're so aggressive with endocrine therapy in the early stage setting. I want to, um, the, I want to just uh, maybe Joe, although you had the other thing to talk about, we'll do it next time, but the, uh, to have you comment on the uh, comments in the Q and A, which is a study of PADA one and following CT DNA in the CT DNA in the metastatic setting to assess treatment response. So circulating tumor DNA uh, and uh, whether or not that should really be used as a uh, clinical standard or, you know, we need more data. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting study and a, a very interesting approach, which, you know, makes sense, right? I, I, I think the question is, um, is this going to improve overall survival, right? Um, Why don't I just describe what it is that... Yeah, so this is a study that um, of hormone therapy where patients were randomized to either, you know, you start the hormone therapy and then you're getting CT DNA. This is looking at tumor DNA in the blood um, at various time points. And the question is, do you, let's say you start seeing an increase in your CT DNA. This is all in the metastatic setting, which would suggest that the disease might be growing on whatever hormone therapy or any treatment that you're on um, versus what we do currently, which is we get CAT scans and we make assessment of progression based on CAT scans. The question here is if we have an early marker of progression based on the circulating tumor DNA, if we start seeing a rise, um, should we be switching therapy based on that? Or do we continue to wait until we're seeing that change, the increase on a CAT scan, which is the current standard? And, and what this study found is that if you do make a change based on the uh, circulating tumor DNA, then the uh, amount of time that the patient can respond to the next line is longer than if you just stay on the, the hormone therapy and wait for progression based on the scan, which you know is not too surprising. But then the question is, when you make that switch, um, a second time, do, do patients continue to have 
longer disease control in the long run? I, I think that's the question we don't know yet because it, the principle in metastatic disease is that we want to get the most out of every treatment before we make a change so that we have lots of options available to us and also gives time for new drugs to be developed and new drugs to be approved. And so if we start switching the treatment too early, is it possible that we're not getting the most out of each one? Maybe we'll run out of options down the road. So I, I think this is a really interesting approach um, and, and I think we need to, to validate it further, but I think we have to see, does it improve overall survival? Yeah, because I think that, um, you know, one of the things that are worrisome about it is that you would see your ctDNA going up and you would change treatment and it might be six months before, you, before you'd actually have clinical, um, you know, disease progression. And uh, I think um, Kelly Shanahan makes an important point that for uh, PADA-1, where, you know, basically they were monitoring patients every three months, they looked for the appearance of a mutation, the estrogen receptor uh, which is called an ESR1 mutation that we know generates relative resistance to aromatase inhibitors like letrozole and astrozole exemestane. So then the idea was if you changed endocrine therapy, would you have a better outcome? And, you know, but I think really that rapid changing, unless you're going to change survival or major change in quality of life, it's hard to know. There's an ongoing trial called Serena 6 that's looking at doing the same kind of approach and changing the hormone therapy to an oral form of fulvestrant. But again, this is a complicated area because we may want to be giving other targeted agents there. We're waiting for a drug to get approved called capivacertib uh, that blocks a pathway that's activated in a lot of breast cancer. And we're hoping to see that drug approved by the end of the year. So then do you really want to give a single hormone therapy? So, and I think, you know, you don't want to react to it just like for tumor markers, we have to be really careful. Laura, last thoughts? No, I totally agree. I think um, the idea of getting as much bang from your buck out of each line of therapy um, is, is really important and not switching too early. Like, so along the lines of tumor markers, like you said, here is, is kind of the same concept. Um, but I think the idea of using CTDA still does have potential value in the future. I think also in early stage disease, there's some trials looking at if you do tech CTDNA, should you do something differently there? I think it's way too early to do that clinically yet outside the context of research. Um, but I think um, it's definitely an interesting question in both settings that we'll have to um, follow in the future. Absolutely. And um, what about in uh, patients who have uh, Joe lobular cancer where it's hard to find it? Would that be something that we should be using? Yeah, um, I, I, I do, although um, this needs to be validated in the study. And um, for those that don't know, lobular cancers, which makes up about 15% of all breast cancers, they, these are historically, or not historically, we know that these are more radiographically occult, um, and that both in the early stage and in the metastatic setting. Um, and so sometimes it's hard to assess if the disease is progressing on scans. Um, and also the way the disease grows, it tends to um, form sheets and it can infiltrate the linings of the abdomen, of the, of the lung, of the heart. And so it's not measurable on a CT scan. And what, what that means often is that these patients aren't eligible for our clinical trials. Most of these require measurable disease. Um, and we, so we need better tools to assess lobular specifically. I mean, for all patients, but specifically for lobular and CT DNA might be that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting because in metastatic disease, sometimes patients have bone dominant disease and you really can't even see if the cancer is progressing or not. But again, I, you know, we really need studies to try and understand this better. And then lastly, because we still have questions coming in, but it's way over time. So um, there are um, new imaging modalities, FES PET looking at estrogen, FAP PET, which is looking at fibrosis and scarring. It's unclear exactly what are the better studies to be done. I just had a patient who had a negative FES pet in bone, but had a breast biopsy that was strongly positive for estrogen receptor. So a little odd. I'm not exactly sure what we'll have to follow her over time to figure it out. But, um, you know, the FES pet is looking at estrogen. Um, so it's a radio labeled estrogen. And if you have the estrogen receptor, it should light up, but it doesn't work in the liver. And it's just hard to know. I don't know. Are you getting those studies, FES PET? I would say uh, 
not routinely, not routinely. It's hard to know if that's going to really help us understand uh, yeah. what, you know, whether patients really have hormone sensitive disease or not. We need bigger trials, but there are some trials ongoing, so that's good. Well, it's been an amazing discussion and uh, we went over, we appreciate all the people who stayed on, all the questions that happened and uh, and to my incredible colleagues who have lots to do and worked all day in clinic and still stayed all this time away from home just to talk to you guys, to educate you and are so committed and passionate about the work that they do. Um, and uh, for Michelle, I had to leave with her uh, for our international visitor dropping in this evening. So um, I, I'm just so grateful and also very grateful to Melody, who volunteers her time after work to make the forum happen. So thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing all of you at our next forum this fall. Send us your thoughts, send us your comments, and thanks for being here.